Well, hello and welcome. Today on Craft d and I'm going to talk about non-weapon proficiencies. Now, while playing Advanced Dungeons & Dragons 1st Edition back in the day, you really didn't have things like advanced um, weapons proficiencies or anything like that. But my 5e players have asked, where are the skill rolls? I want to roll for perception, I want to roll investigation, and I want to roll to see if she is lying. <laughs> Back in the day, now we just didn't have skill rolls like that. At least I don't remember them <laughs> it being like that. I don't really remember it in second edition. Instead, the DM would ask, how are you going to do whatever it is you were trying to do? And then I would just try to explain how my character would actually accomplish whatever it was I was trying to, to, to do. For example, uh, something like an investigation role, I would explain how my character searched through the desk and checked under the bed. After a bit of role play, I would find whatever was findable and we would go on. I would ask what is on the desk, what are in the drawers. I check behind the drawers and the DM might say, you find a sealed letter and four silver pieces. I'm not sure when D&D became so watered down that all a player has to say is, I want to search the desk. And the DM says, roll investigation. Oh look, you found a sealed letter and four silver pieces. It doesn't seem like, um, it's, it seems to me that 5e, while I like 5e, it's a lot of fun, it seems that some of those aspects like that are a little bit watered down, where it's more of a roll to see what happens. Um, granted, you can still role play it out, but you know that you found it. You know what you're going to find. Um, so, of course, there is plenty of roll to see what happened moments in 1st edition too, such as combat. But they're less common out of combat and are sometimes used to determine more of a level of success instead of outright success and failure. So let's take a look at non-weapon proficiencies in Advanced Dungeons & Dragons 1st Edition. Uh, in 2nd Edition, the, the non-weapon proficiencies were an optional role, role right in the player's handbook. I'm not sure when they became part of the core game. I didn't play 3rd or 5th, 4th. Uh, proficiencies didn't start out as part of the core rules, that's for sure. But looking through my books, I found some optional rules for non-weapon proficiencies on say, page 52 of the Oriental Adventures. Let's go ahead and flip to that. So right here, there's the non-weapon proficiency rules right here on page 42. Um, there may have been some Dragon Magazine articles, but this is the first time in the official books I think that, that the rule was offered as an optional rule. Now, not everybody owned Oriental Adventures, so I'm guessing the rule wasn't used a whole lot. Um, page 51 shows you how many proficiencies you can earn per level, and the penalty for not having a proficiency in a particular skill. Samurai, for example, started with five proficiencies and added one proficiency every level. Uh, compared to the Oriental Barbarian, they started with nine proficiencies, but only added one every theory levels. So, one interesting thing to point out here is the types of proficiencies listed. Um, there were Artisan, Barbarian, Common, and Court. Um, so each of these were, each of these listed the number of uh, skill slots, proficiency slots required to use them. For example, here, agriculture needed one, animal handling two. These were under common proficiencies. Court proficiencies might include calligraphy requiring two slots or religion requiring one, the tea ceremony requiring two. And then of course, there's a base chance of success if you had the proficiency. Uh, most often they required one slot, but there are a few like the uh, weaponsmith here that required three slots. The barbarian proficiency of tracking required three. One is pretty common, two is a few, and there's a couple of threes that I noticed in here just kind of thumbing through it real quick. 
So you could get even better proficiency by spending more slots and you get plus one to the die roll that you would spend. Um, the next reference book was the Dungeoneer Survival Guide. And that's on page 23. Now, a lot of this content is similar to uh, the Oriental Adventures book. Uh, table 10 lists the proficiency, the slots required, and the appropriate ability, and then the die roll modifier. Excuse me, table 10. I got ahead of myself. I got ahead of myself. Uh, lists the class, the number of weapon and non-weapon proficiencies, and then how often you could add those weapon and non-weapon proficiencies. For example, the Paladin, he started with three weapon and two non-weapon. You got to add one of each every couple of levels. Compared to like the Magic user, it was started with one weapon and three non-weapon, but only got to add one weapon or two non-weapon every six levels. The monk may have had it about the best. They started with one weapon and non weapon and one non weapon and got to add one of each every couple of levels. So like the monk, the cavalier, paladin, they probably had it about the best there because they could add every couple of levels there. And some of the other ones start did start with a few more. And that they had to wait a long time before they got to add any more of them. And of course, the book discusses the things like success and failures and how the proficiency check works. Um, optional bonuses, introduce the artisan, craftsman, and other NPCs who could become better skilled than an adventurer who was using a lot of their time adventuring. So an, an, an NPC could uh, create really ex intricate and exquisite works whereas the adventurer would not be able to attain the, quite that level. Now you could substitute a weapon proficiency for a non-weapon proficiency but not the other way around so no extra weapons for the magic user not that they would want them. Uh, none of the non-weapon prof proficiencies gave experience points either. So the proficiencies offered here are a little bit different from Oriental Adventures. Instead of groups, uh, we have adventuring proficiencies and craftsman proficiencies. So here on page 24, it says, Adventuring proficiencies represent skills and increase a character's capacity for dealing with the underground environment. Some useful adventuring proficiencies include climbing, swimming, and boating. Craftsman proficiencies generally represent skills that a character prepare for adventuring. And these skills often require a great deal more equipment and resources than adventuring skills do. Weaponsmith, smelter, and boatwright are proficiencies of the craftsman class. Now, back in the day, and one of my first edition characters actually died by falling into a chasm full of water in a dungeon. So maybe having a proficiency like that would have helped them, you know, having some swimming proficiency, but uh, probably not. He wasn't a very clever uh, character anyway, so I wasn't real sad to see him go. Now somewhere else that we could find proficiencies discussed is in the Wilderness Survival Guide. Um, Now, this is essentially the same information than what's in the Dungeoneer Survival Guide. Uh, you have, and it even says it right here, that the system is essentially the same as that described in the Dungeoneer Survival Guide for handling non-weapon proficiencies. Depending on its class and level, some of these are weapon proficiency slots that can be filled by skill with a certain weapon. So, they kind of added to it they didn't replace it or tweak it too much as compared to say the oriental adventures to the dungeon survival guide there was a quite a few differences there here they're just basically adding some um, some helpful ones such as direction scent sense uh, this is a skill that those in who do play fifth edition for example tomb of annihilation in, in fifth edition the survival skill there direction sense would be similar to that skill and we all know it's handy not to get lost when you're out in the jungle whether it's uh 1e or 5e 
Uh, both the books also mention blind white, blind fighting as a proficiency. Now, this is a great ability because it reduces penalties when fighting in the dark. This doesn't really exist in 5e, um, unless one of the recent books I haven't read have it. But of course, in 5e, almost everybody can already see in the dark, so I guess it's not really needed unless you're playing a human for some reason. Now... I don't remember really using any of these proficiencies when I played 1E, although we did dabble with them quite a bit uh, when I played 2E, uh, especially if the DM was on the fence and wanted Fate to decide our next move, or at least give the illusion that Fate was deciding. Instead, the player was generally rewarded with a success for good role-playing and wouldn't normally try to claim knowledge or ability in an area that didn't make sense for them. For example, the cleric wouldn't suddenly become an expert at boating unless it was somehow justified in their character, and the DM would probably call them out if they tried. But often the DM would make some rolls behind their screen, they might not be explained, and they might have been done simply for fun. So it wasn't definitely about moving the story forward, and less about rolling the dice. Well, well anyway, I'm going to introduce these proficiencies to my 5e players who are playing in my 1e game and see how it works out. It should be interesting. Did you use proficiencies in your games back in the day? Or have you remained a 1e purist and ignore the dreaded orange spined books? Leave a comment below and if you enjoyed this video, give me a like. Don't forget to subscribe and hit the bell icon. As always, thanks for watching.